Philippians chapter 2. Second chapter of Philippians. Now we've been focusing, as Gerald said this month, on the Revelation song from Revelation chapter uh, 5. It's, um, you know, all through the Word of God, I don't know if you've ever really thought about this much, and in our text, biblical text, you know, the printed text that we hold as Bibles, uh, whenever there are songs in, the te in our text, they don't do like we have printed music, you know, with lines and squiggly marks, you know, quarter notes and things like that. <clears throat> but all through, the, all through the Word of God, from Genesis through Revelation, there are songs. All through. Um, in heaven, the Revelation song, the saints with God and the an angelic hosts are all presented as being consumed with worship, consumed with song and praise of God. The saints of God in this life um, that you and I live, we are filled with song. Uh, uh, Psalm 40, chapter 40, says of the redeemed of God, you know, I, I was in the pit, I was almost God. The Lord lifted me up and he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and put their trust in the Lord. The defining characteristic of the child of God is the song in our heart. And if you don't have that song, the song of the redeemed, if you don't have the revelation song in your heart, I'm not saying you're a trained musician, okay? I'm not talking about how good you can sing. But if you don't have that song in your heart, you don't have Christ in your heart. If you don't have that song in your heart, you have not Christ in your heart. And we're going to be studying about that this morning for just a few minutes. Stand with me. Uh, this is one of those songs here in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. It's one of the songs that's, uh, all, like I said, all through the Word of God. It starts in verse number 5, Philippians 2, 5. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue in our focus, ver focus verse, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Um, for our Lord Jesus. And we thank you for the song of the redeemed. We thank you for the new song you've placed in our heart through the presence of your spirit, the spirit of Christ within us. Lord, I pray that you'd bear upon our, uh, every heart here today the, the truth, the significance of your, what your word teaches about this uh, aspect of confession the confession of Christ as Lord for the glory of your name. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> the word confession, um, the, the idea of confessing, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this even within the Christian community. There, there are many that, that hold to an idea somehow or another uh, that a requirement to confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord is somehow or another a false addition to salvation. Um, I think we want to look at what God's Word says about that. At uh, the beginning point here in 1 John, the little uh, letter of 1 John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John toward the end, 1 John chapter 4, I want you to look at this in 1 John chapter 4 because this is how profoundly significant uh, this issue of confessing Christ as Lord really is. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, look at the verses 2 and 3. 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. <clears throat> this is how you know the Spirit of God, right? 
So this is for understanding. God wants us to know something, without a doubt. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. In other words, that's a confession of the incarnation of Christ, that Christ was with God in heaven, Christ was the creator, as John says in chapter 1 of, of the gospel, <clears throat> but that he came, he became a human being, the incarnation. That's what he's talking about. Every spirit who does not, verse 3, every spirit who does not confess Jesus is not from God. Now look at this. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. You've heard that he's coming, and he's already in the world now. Now John wrote that some 2,000 years ago, and you know what? The spirit of Antichrist has not left the world to this day. The spirit of Antichrist is here. As a matter of fact, it's, uh, it's the number one issue in our entire world today. It's the global issue. Uh, we, we may call it different things. Uh, for The war on terror might be a word. The real issue of the entire global conflict that we have, we call terrorism or stuff, is an Antichrist movement to deny that Jesus is Lord. That's what's going on in the world. It's not a political war. It's not a war with nations. It spans the entire globe. Over this one confession, Christ Jesus is Lord. Now, there are those that want to deny this. Uh, there are those both outside of Christianity that would deny that Christ is Lord. There are those within Christianity who have come out of Christianity who have developed truly false doctrines that deny that Jesus Christ was the incarnated Son of God, that deny that Jesus Christ was God come in the flesh, that would deny that Jesus Christ had a literal death, a literal resurrection, and after three days literally ascended from the dead and then ascended in some 40 days into heaven in front of them and that one day he will literally come back. There are many with inside the quote church that would deny all of that reality. And it's all built around, the whole issue of our day is built around this one thing. Will you confess Christ is Lord? If not, if you will not confess that, you are under the spirit of Antichrist. And when you die, you will go to hell for eternity. Does that sound serious enough for you? It's the issue of our day. Turn back to John's Gospel, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. Now, we had this verse uh, last week, and we have it again today. It's a little different point in the verse. Verses 42 and 43. And the point here, why would somebody not confess Christ as Lord? Uh, the Bible presents that one of the main reasons is because of fear. The fear of, of man or the fear of rejection. Look here verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many, speaking about the Jewish elders, rulers, the Pharisees, many, many did believe in him because, even among the rulers, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him Notice that. They would not publicly confess him. So they would not be banned from the synagogue. <gasps> oh my goodness. Banned from the synagogue. For they love praise from men more than praise from God. Real quick. Now this isn't in our PowerPoint. Turn back to John chapter 3. Just to kind of substantiate this. John chapter 3. This is where Nicodemus, you know, comes up to Jesus. And he was a ruler of the Jews. As a matter of fact, Nicodemus was among the ruling class of the Pharisees themselves. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, if you will. And look at what he says in verse number 2. This man came to him at night. In other words, he was afraid to approach him at daytime. He had to come slithering around at nighttime, right? This man comes to him at night and says, Rabbi, teacher, look at, don't miss this. We know, okay? 
we no who's he talking about he's talking about the Pharisees okay rabbi we know that you have come from God as a teacher for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him don't ever forget that don't miss that point the Pharisees knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ was Mashiach, the Messiah of God. They knew that. That's why, for example, in the 12th chapter, you find Jesus <clears throat> saying what they were doing. They were attributing, they started to attribute the power to do the miracles to Beelzebub. He does this by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus says in John 12, this is the unpardonable sin. This is unpardonable because they knew, they knew, they knew he was the Messiah of God. But yet they chose to resist, to fight against him, and even to attribute the great works that he did to Satan himself. Jesus said, you won't be forgiven of that. Forgiven of that. That's the unpardonable sin. That's in the 12th chapter. They knew that Jesus was from God. So back in chapter 12, the only thing that God gives us permission to fear, the only thing, the only thing God gives us permission to fear is himself. We have no permission to fear any other thing. No power, no entity, no group, no threat, only God. That's important in understanding the significance of confessing that Christ is Lord. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Gospel of Matthew chapter 10. Now we're looking here at uh, Christ's words himself. And of course, all, all, every word of scripture, you know, is inspired by God. But when Jesus himself chooses to focus on a particular topic, you know, it's not that it's more inspired than any other thing, but it's like I'm thinking, you better p really pay careful attention to this. All right? I think we all need to pay careful attention to what Jesus says here. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, look at verse 32. Matthew 10, 32. Therefore, anyone who will acknowledge me, and that's the same word, confess. Okay? Anyone who will confess me before men... I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Or I'll confess him before my Father in heaven. 33. But. But. This is, this is a big conjunction here. But. Don't miss this. Anyone who denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Don't assume I've come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And he goes on to ta talk about how significant he demands allegiance, even above, above family allegiance. You know, there, there are many that almost seem like, you know, they want to wrap Christianity around the worship of the family. No. Jesus says, I must be Lord. I must be number one above every other relationship in your life if not you have not confessed Christ as Lord all right um, in the uh, in the New Testament day in the time of the writing of the New Testament this this became as a, a, as it is today the singular issue of the whole Western world the movement of Christianity in the Roman Empire, Caesar, the Caesar, the king, he was perceived as being the, the great one, the Lord. And it was part of their national confession. Once a year, at an appointed time, every citizen of the Roman Empire had to stand before a magistrate and confess that Caesar was Lord. It went something like this. Caesar is curios. Caesar is Lord. And if you refuse to confess that Caesar was Lord, Caesar is curious. 
you're immediately put to death as a traitor. That was, if you will, that was kind of a problem for these new believers. <laughs> because they only would confess Christ as Lord. So they would stand before the magistrates in whatever nation they were in, in the Roman Empire. And the magistrate would demand the response. Caesar is curious. And the Christians would stand. And not with arrogance. And not in defiance you know, in, in spirit. But in humility, they would respond, Christos is curios. Christos is curios. And they'd be taken to their death. You've heard about the Roman Colosseum, the great Colosseum in Rome. And this Colosseum, you know, the gladiators, you probably might have seen the gladiator movie where the gladiators would fight. This was also where they had uh, the festivity of, you know, sacrificing the Christians down there. They'd bring in a group of Christians at times, not all the time. Sometimes it was just gladiator, gladiator. But whenever the Nero, during the reign of Nero, during the writing of the Revelation itself, the last book of the Bible, increasingly, increasingly the focus was upon the persecution of the followers of Christ. Uh, when I say follower of Christ, I mean those that confessed Christ. That was a follower of Christ. And so they would take the Christians into the floor of the Roman Colosseum. There was a great, uh, one of the great early church fathers was Polycarp. Polycarp was a direct, he was a disciple of the Apostle John. In other words, John trained Polycarp. John mentored Polycarp into the ways of God, the truth of God, the word of God. Uh, Polycarp walked with John to the day of his martyrdom on Patmos. Polycarp, um, around the turn of the century, near you know, 100 AD, snuck into the Roman Colosseum for one of the uh, festivities. There were the gladiators, there were the lions, and there were the ragtag believers. Uh, the, the, the appeal, the, the, the opportunity was presented, you know, with a loud shout. Proclaim, confess that Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Kyrios. And the Christians in unison would say, Christos. Is curious. And the crowd would go into a rage, gnashing of teeth, thrashing, kill them, kill them. They would scream. And the gladiators would advance with chariot and sword, and the lions would be set loose with the gaping jaws and roar and the tearing and the thrashing of flesh. And the crowd would roar in bloodlust Give us their blood. And in the middle of the chaos, Polycarp recorded that from the floor of the stadium, the song of the redeemed would be lifted up as the men and women and children of God would start to sing the Revelation song. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christos. Is curious. Even above the roar, you could hear them sing to their last breath, Christ is Lord. Polycarp said that in the stands, as the Christians were killed, that suddenly people would fall under conviction in the crowd. Those that were screaming for their blood suddenly were filled with tears and, and anguish as they saw the Christians die. And he said around them suddenly they would fall on their faces and they would start to cry out, Christos is curious, Christ is Lord. I want to ask you to turn to Romans chapter 10.
this thing of becoming a Christian is really not a it's not that it's not a hocus pocus kind of thing it's a spiritual reality yes but there's a very simple if you will prescription or requirement given here verses 9 and 10 of Romans 10 it's very succinct it's not complicated but it's profound verse 9 if you confess with your mouth in other words this is public this is a public if you'll confess publicly that's what that means if you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord Christos is Kyrios and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved Amen. With the heart one believes resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth one confesses resulting in salvation. And the scripture says no one who believes on him will be put to shame. Verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Remember the, remember the Pharisees, Nicodemus, they believed. They believed. Oh, they believed. But they would not confess. And they're in hell tonight. Look in uh, Romans 14, verse 11. Romans 14, 11. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, as I live. That, in that statement, God is saying, everything that I am, you know, that is a self-declared truth. As I live. As surely as I live. As surely as I'm God. All right? As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will give praise to God. Or, if you will, every tongue will confess. You know what, though, friend? If you won't do that here in this life, you will confess in the afterlife. But if you will not do it here in this life, it'll be too late in the next life. But you will acknowledge He is Lord one way or the other. That's what God says. As surely as I live... That day will come. You will confess Christ is Lord. I want us to bow for our word of prayer. Romans 10 said, If you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. I suspect everyone here believes in their heart the, you know the story of Christ I don't know if everyone here has confessed with their mouth that he's Lord and it's those two things it's both of those things believe remember the Pharisees believed but fear kept them from confessing It's the great issue of our day. It's the great worldwide issue of our day. The confession of Christ as Lord. And it's been that way for 2,000 years. It's not new. And God's word has not changed. I'm going to ask us to do something here this morning. I'm going to ask us, um, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask you to stand up. And before Joel starts the music, I'm going to ask us to do a public confession. And it's going to be a very simple confession. Three words. Jesus is Lord. Okay? 
if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you know, the whole narrative of Christ, the incarnation. Make that confession today. And the word of God says you'll be saved. Father, we thank you for your love for us, and we thank you for your word. And I thank you for the opportunity to study your word together. Lord, hear our confession. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you would, just stand with me. And if you'd like to make it even a little more real, look at your neighbor and say these words, Jesus is Lord, on the count of three. Jesus is Lord. Let's do it this way. Let's say, Jesus is my Lord. Okay? Jesus is my Lord. If you meant that, I'll see you in heaven someday. Amen. Now, you might want to come and stand and confess that before the whole church, as in you've never really made a public confession and become a part of a church. Now, we'd be delighted. We'd be honored to have you join with us today. Joel, you lead us as we sing.
and let's confess this together that you are stronger. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is Jesus, you.